This is 91.3 FM, WCW in Worcester, Massachusetts, the Dr. Chris Radio of Horror program. And tonight on Radio of Horror, we have from the movie Don't Fall Asleep, a Nightmare on Elm Street fan film, we have Paige Joy on the show with us. Thank you for coming on the show with us, Director Joy. Hello. So you're a pretty big Nightmare on Elm Street fan yourself, as, as we are. You've seen every single movie? I have. So you watched every episode of the TV series? Oh my god, you're not that much of a true fan. <laughs> I'm horrible, I'm horrible. Uh, I was having an interesting conversation with uh, Deandra, who plays your star uh, Nancy uh, in, the, in the movie, about uh, Wes Craven and young children who've never seen Nightmare on Elm Street. And I got interviewed last week as a filmmaker by the seventh grader uh, who was doing a re- report in uh, like middle school on horror movies, which is kind of cool. And his father told me that they've never se- that he has never seen the original Nightmare on Elm Street, which I was like, okay, he's you know only twelve, that's fine. But then he turns around and tells me, oh, we watched the remake, and I was like, what? No, that sounds. He needs to lose his uh, parent card. Oh, I was like, how? He's like, I don't like old stuff. <laughs> no. oh my God. <laughs> That's what the kid said to me. He's like, I don't like old stuff. The movie's 32 years old. And I was like, uh. <laughs> Like, my mind is blowing right now. It's, oh, my God. And then later that day, I was going through a bunch of papers and throwing out, like, business cards and stuff like that and, and stuff that I required. It's like people who, like, I can't figure out who they are. I'm not going to have them on the show. Or people was like, oh, my God, I got to get to these people. And then in the pile of cards on this sticky note, was uh, a, a post-it to me from Wes Craven uh, with his manager's contact information and, you know, goodbye, Chris, and then uh, here's my manager's contact information uh, signed to Wes or whatever. And I was just, like, almost tearing up when I saw it. I was, like, I immediately went on Facebook and contacted Deandra. I was like, oh, my God, I just found this note from Wes Craven <laughs> to me. Oh, my God. First of all, I'm so jealous. That's such an amazing thing now to even have to like save. Like you need to like put it in like a frame or something. Oh, it's in the it's in his book, uh, Welcome to My Nightmare that he signed for me when I met him. Oh my god, okay, awesome. That's yeah, awesome. he was at a okay, so get this, you'll love this, and this is appropriate. This is a nightmare on Elm Street kind of show is what we're doing tonight. So Wes Craven came to Boston in two thousand thirteen. And he was on a film he was on sorry, it wasn't anything about film. It was about fear. It was a Boston book convention. And it was the same weekend as Rock and Shock, which is a big horror convention that was happens in Worcester, which, by the way, that same weekend, Robert was in town. And I brought with me a Blu-ray copy that I picked up of Nightmare on Elm Street and had Wes sign it. And I gave it to the convention heads at Rock and Shock saying, Wes signed this, by the way, for you. Get Robert to sign it. Stick it in your uh, charity auction for the, for the, the kitty farm or whatever it is you're raising money for this year. Yeah. And it, they got like uh, like 125 um uh, dollar ticket entries for it. Oh my god! Yeah, 125 because it was officially signed by Wes Craven and Robert England. That's awesome. And that person is the luckiest person alive because you're never gonna get that again. You know yeah, what right. I mean? And yeah. and uh, yeah, so and all it probably cost them was a dollar because again it was just a dollar tickets. You know what I mean? Raffle that that was fantastic. And they get they again they said I got 125 for it. So l- let me get back to the panel. So Wes is on this panel about fear. And the other people on the panel are a woman who used to be a CIA operative working in Iraq. No, sorry. She was just a CIA operative. And she was able to finally declassify her first mission and write a book about it. One was a Boston Globe employee that was in Iraq undercover for 10 years. And she just came back. (laughs) Living like... She said, that like, a lot of times she was literally living to look like a man because of being an American woman in Iraq was not a healthy thing. And then the third person on the panel was a woman who finally – who wrote a book about – these are all authors – and uh, who wrote a book about a home invasion that happened when she was 14. Her sister was 12 years ago, and they lied to their parents saying that, oh, yeah, they came in, they stole the stuff, they tied us up, and they left us in the basement. What she never told her parents, though, was that the three robbers gang raped her and her sisters for hours before they robbed the place. And she finally admitted it like several months ago and wrote a book about it. Wow. Yeah. And they're on a panel with Wes Craven. <laughs> of all people. Of Wes all people. Craven. And I'm like, like, like he's the godfather of fear. And and has has anyone seen his movies? Um, right. The Hills Have Eyes, The he Last House on the Left. They're getting like, more like, inspiration for movies. I'm <laughs> just like, do you know what he's done to women in his movies? 
No, I can't even watch The Hills Have Eyes. That's like one of his movies that I can't watch still to this day. It's really hard for me. I was so baffled by that. Who put that panel together? Who thought that was a good idea? Yeah, you brought Wes Craven to Boston. It was free. (laughs) I went to the thing. It was free. And then, of course, he has this line out the door, people, with, you know. And I had, um, I had again, I had the Blu-ray to give away. And I had my book copy of his biography. And I also had my copy of the DVD of The Night on Elm Street. And he forgot to sign that. And I didn't realize it until I got back to my car. I'm like, oh, no. He didn't sign my DVD. Oh, well, I got him to sign my book. That's fine. I would have been like hunting him down. I would have been like running back in there. I would have been like knocking on every I power. know. I would have been like, Mr. Craven. <laughs> but I got a picture with him, which is pretty nice. So, <laughs> yeah. That's so. Like, like, I wish that like I would have been able to like meet him and like get a picture with him. I interacted with him somewhat like on Instagram and stuff, but it was never like conversations or anything it was like just watching him post stuff about his cats so so i also got a little trouble at the at the panel as well because uh so they do the q a with everyone or whatever and i had to heckle him a little bit about a couple of disaster films he's made which he had a laugh about he's like oh there's a comedian right here (laughs) and then i finally got to his table and he goes no no i appreciate that no one has no one's usually brave enough to actually ever you know (laughs) mention the disasters in my life (laughs) No, those are fine questions. Don't worry, because everyone usually asks me the typical questions. But you, you were brave enough to. <laughs> and my friends were like, "You heckled Wes Craven on stage. You are so dead." <laughs> but Wes said I had a bra- had courage. <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> it was about like Swamp Thing and like Vampire in Brooklyn and Cursed. <laughs> I love it. So I got a question, Mr. Craven, about <laughs> Cursed <laughs> and uh, Swamp Thing. <laughs> cursed was, I feel like Cursed was good. I feel like it's one of those, like, cult films. Oh, like, it's such a CGI nightmare of a movie. I <laughs> <laughs> oh, curse on here? I feel so bad. I'm like, I just realized. You can drop I'm everything but an like... F-bomb, uh, but I'll, I'll probably edit that out if you drop an F-bomb. It's fine. So, so what made you want to make this type of Nightmare on Elm Street movie? What's your, so, what's your story behind it? So what happened was, I guess I'll start at like the beginning. I I have always wanted to make like a scary movie. I've always been interested in doing film. My background, I'm a hairstylist, makeup artist, and special effects artist. But since I was a kid, I always, that's one of my producers right now. Um, (laughs) Since I was a kid, I've always wanted to like make my own horror film. I never really had like the right story. I always like ripped off Scream and all that stuff, you know, like typical like 12 year old doing stuff. And um, as I got older, life just kind of happened, and I didn't really get a chance to do it. And we went to Horror Hound Indy last year, and our friend Nathan Thomas Milner, he premiered um, The Confessions of Fred Krueger. And we watched it, and it just was so beautiful. And Kevin Roach's performance was just amazing, and it was beautifully shot, and it was beautifully written. And I just really saw the passion that like he had put into it. And we were sitting in the hotel room that night, and I just said to Deandra, and I said to um, Michelle, not, our other really good friend. Not that, to interrupt you, but said, what what uh, what was the name of that F- Freddy film again? The fan film? The Confessions of Fred Krueger. Yes, yes. I think I actually had the writer of that on my show last week. Nathan Thomas Milner? No, I had one of the producers then. <laughs> oh, okay. I was just saying, yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that he was the writer. I'm pretty sure he wrote it. I'm not no. sure if he... I'd have to look into it. No, no, I think I had one of the producers on my show last week. Oh, okay, awesome. Yeah, it's, it just was an amazing film. Um, it's still, like, it's doing so well online, and, like, it's doing so well in, like, the festivals that he submitted it to. So we were sitting in the hotel room, and I said to Deandra and to Michelle, who are also my producing partners on this, I said, you know what, we should make a Nancy film. And we all just kind of laughed, and kind of laughed it off and then we went home after the weekend and I texted them in a group text and I was like I'm serious like we should make a Nancy film so we're like let's do it so we tossed out ideas and I think the biggest question for people and the biggest question for us really um was where where was Nancy in Nightmare 2 you know what was she doing you know we we have the comic book series that is considered canon in the Nightmare on Elm Street world and we saw her diary in Nightmare 2 with, like, Jesse when he's moving into her room. But we don't really know what happened to her. So 
we know that she comes back in Nightmare 3 and all of a sudden she's this grad student, you know, studying dream therapy. So we were like, let's build a film around that. So from there, the, the ideas just kept flowing. And every day we were, okay, let's do this. Let's do that. Let's do this. And then finally, um, I sat down and wrote the opening scene. I wrote, this is how it should start. And then I sent it to them and then it just exploded. So it took us probably about like five months of rewrites, maybe four or five months of rewrites. until we finally decided on a script that honored Nancy's character and, you know, paid homage to Wes and paid homage to this series that he essentially built. And so we just came up with this great idea. And then we started casting it and, started doing a lot of stuff behind the scenes and everything was just really hush hush before we even started production. And then we posted about it and it exploded. <laughs> How long is the production going to take on it? We're not saying <laughs> I'm actually, I'm under a very strict non-disclosure agreement. So I'm limited on a lot of stuff. I can say, I actually asked today, like, can I start saying a little bit more, like revealing a little bit more? They're like, yeah, for sure. But just don't, say this don't say that so production schedule um we're slated to start in april and then hopefully we'll be finished by the end of april whose movie is it if you're not allowed to talk about it it's mine <laughs> it, it's mine michelle and deandra's and the three of us mutually agreed on this is what we're allowed to talk about so we all sign non-disclosures all of our actors have non-disclosure agreements anybody that's involved anybody that we're like bringing on they have non-disclosure agreements because you guys are really going to love it. That's all. That's, that's what I can say. The reason why we're doing this, because we have a lot of um, surprises that are going to happen in this film that the fans are kind of going to lose their crap. Is it going to be a full length movie, like an hour and a half or a short? No, we're doing 45 minutes. Okay. So our goal is to do it at least 45 minutes. So our, our, our production time is, it's going to be crazy to film it, but we, um, hopefully after everything is edited, it's going to be 45 minutes. When making a fan film, how do you get over the loopholes of, uh, copyright infringement? Like, uh, could the current Star Trek project Axiom is being sued by Paramount and CBS, uh, because of it being a fan film. Wow. So this is how we get around it. <laughs> We're not making any money from it whatsoever. And it's technically, considered you're making a parody nancy had a good old time parody. between films That's what it is. <laughs> she was on a vacation sunbathing That's what it is. <laughs> it, it's technically considered a parody we're not using any of the you can have a benny hill chase sequence with freddie chasing her in and out of different dreams and stuff like that <laughs> <laughs> very um wax work too right like, yes how exactly <laughs> um no we're, we're it technically falls under the guidelines of a parody and as long as we don't um, make a profit or make any money from it, we're we're all good. So that's one of the reasons why we like didn't do a Kickstarter or anything. Yeah, that's one thing I noticed is I was just like, well, why don't you do a Kickstarter? And then I forgot, oh, wait, this is not like a documentary like Mark's. This is, you know, and I don't even know how he's able to get, a, get, get away with that because he's still technically using like the, you know, Nightmare stuff and Freddy's yes, name. And, so huh? that's why he did that's why he did a Kickstarter. Mark, um, Mark is actually a good friend of mine. He actually has to, he has to pay for that. So that's why they did a Kickstarter. Uh -huh. he, funded so he funded the majority of it, but he had to do a Kickstarter for like finishing because um, something so small as you know a ten second clip is you know thousands and thousands. Of I thought dollars. that you were allowed to use up like the thirty seconds or something like that for a promotion or something. That's on YouTube. That's so on, on YouTube. YouTube. Okay, that's YouTube's guidelines. Um, I, I, I avoid all that. I just use still photos and that's apparently a lot. That's, that's more okay than using any type of video clip. And I, I say that now in a lot of my review videos, I stick on YouTube saying, I'm just gonna let you guys know right now. You're not gonna see any clips from the show. It's gonna be a lot of still photos. So that way I don't have to deal with YouTube's copyright bullshit. Oh my God. It's horrible. I'm on, I'm on YouTube too. Um, and I do like, um, lifestyle vlogging and like, I'll do like, uh, makeup tutorials and sometimes I'll do special effects tutorials and stuff. Awesome. Yeah. Follow Radio Horror on YouTube and I'll follow you. <laughs> Whee, I more totally subscribers. Totally, like, <laughs> and this is where your interview will go afterwards. <laughs> really? That's awesome. Yeah. Cool. Your entire interview will go up on there. We'll be using whatever we can grab for photos of you in weird compromising positions and situations. Stick them up on YouTube and a slideshow as well as the poster image from your movie. Just to warn you. Awesome. No, I'm, 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 whatever you want to use so you can 
you can use whatever you want to use. The more promotion, the better. And I'll definitely will promote you guys and like shout you guys out and stuff. And um, Deandra will be on after she has something to film and talk about. Because <laughs> I yeah. want the nitty gritty, the dirt from the set. <laughs> Is that what she said to you? Is that what she told you? No, that's I what I told her. Said, I can't do all these interviews. You have to do them with me. I thought. So. Well, I thought the two of you were actually going to come on tonight, but she, but she said that she's got other plans. And then uh, so I said, well, why don't we do yours after you've film done filming, and that way you'll have a ton of stuff to talk about. And she's Heck like, yeah, that actually works better. Yeah. And then we have yeah. your, uh, we we have the musician coming on too. Lito Velasco. Yes, who, and I love his yeah. other stuff. Like he did Leviathan. He did uh, the Fright Night one. Mm-hmm. The the Hellraiser one, Leviathan. Okay. Yeah. So I don't, see, I don't even know. I didn't even know that. I feel like I feel so dumb that I didn't know that. No, I, don't say that. Get, without uh, without caring how old you are, I am 36 years old. And the first time I saw a Nightmare on Elm Street movie was when I was nine. Or ten, my old memory is probably paying tricks on me. It was Nightmare on Elm Street Part Four. However, as any child of the '80s, you knew who Freddy Krueger was. It, it, you could not live in the 1980s, growing up as a child, and not know Freddy Krueger. And he was on Good Morning America, I remember, for Part Four. And in fact, that was the first. I remember that was the first time Robert um, appeared on like a major talk show to promote the Nightmare on Elm Street movies. And it was for Part Four, the the Dream ma- the the Dream Master. And I remember seeing like they showed a clip of like the the Freddy claw in the sand, like a sh- a sand shark coming after um yeah and the the girl in the bikini. I forgot her character's She's name. Yes, thank you. Uh, after her or whatever. And then they were like, ooh, Nightmare on Elm Street Part 4 is now in theaters. Go watch it or whatever. Thanks for coming on, Robert England. And I was like, wow, that was really cool. I want to see that. Again, not realizing what I'm getting into trying to watch this movie. And eventually it was on HBO, and my mom like watched it with me or whatever. <laughs> and all of its gory, you know, unbelievableness or whatever. But my first exposure to him was a documentary that was on when I was like six or seven. I was sick at home, and this was Once Upon a Time when parents would like just leave you know a six six or seven year old the home alone no right. parents no babysitter just, you know just leave them home alone it's okay today absolutely not because <laughs> people like freddy krueger exist right. yeah uh but in the 80s we're in much more reagan era time period you know and he was in a documentary about I, I, I have for years trying to be tracking down in my brain what was the name of this documentary that was playing on TV. It, I, it sh- I saw images of Freddy, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Leatherface Guy, the Toxic Avenger, Jason, and I just remember there was one scene that stuck out was from like Freddy's, uh, the Freddy's Revenge where, where he like slices open his head and pulls back and his brain is there or whatever. And man, I went to bed that night with so many nightmares or whatever, thinking Freddy was going to kill me or something like that. I didn't know who he was. I just like the guy with the bird face is going to kill me. I shouldn't have watched that. But I kept flipping back and forth between that documentary and whatever else I was watching sick on the couch or whatever. And that was my first exposure to Freddy Krueger. What was yours? Before we get there, was that Masters of Horror? This was, was 1986 that- or seven. I don't think so. Oh, uh, okay. I was gonna say the first, my first exposure. I, I am older as well. Um, I am 32. So my first. So you're I mean, somewhat of a product of the 80s as well. I'm, so yes, I'm a total product. Of oh the yeah. 80s. So you were born actually the same year that the Nightmare on Elm Street came out, 1984. Yeah, yeah I was born 83. So. Um, I'll oh, be, oh well. <laughs> <laughs> um, my first exposure to it, I was four years old, and my parents are ridiculously young. And my mom had to work overnights and my dad was exhausted. So he like sat me in front of the TV and didn't realize that HBO was on. And I'm sitting there and I'm watching and it was Dream Warriors. So it was when Dream Warriors premiered on um, HBO. I think it was like 1987 or something or 88 or something. And I watched it and I, I, same thing, was like, oh my God, this is so cool. Like, you know, here's this, you know, Freddy character, like, he was scary and dark, but then, you know, Nancy was on screen and, and Kristen was on screen and I just fell in love with them. I fell in love with like the heroines of the franchise. And then it just kind of like exploded. I became obsessed. I was obsessed with Freddy my entire life now that I think about it. <laughs> so from there I saw a nightmare on street one and then my next door neighbor was babysitting me and she's like, you know, I have, I have Freddie part two. And I was like, oh my God, there's part two. <laughs> like, the damn like, babysitter. Just Dream Warriors and the original one. So like I watched part two and I was like, this doesn't make any sense. And then 
Um, I was like, where's Nancy? And then I saw part four, and then I saw five and six, and then I actually saw um, Wes Craven's New Nightmare for my ninth or tenth birthday. I saw it in theaters. Yeah, I didn't yeah. see them in order at all. <laughs> like like most children who grew up with those movies coming out that were not adults at the time when the movies came out. And this goes for like Jason right. and Halloween as well. You do not see those movies in order as a child. Not like with the Saw movies today where you saw every single one when they came out in theaters. But the the Nightmare, the Halloweens, and the Fridays films, whatever, I, I, I think it went like five, two, four, seven, one, eventually. <laughs> With Nightmare on Elm Street, it was like four, one, five, two, three. <laughs> um, no, but I agree. I um, I, don't, I, I you just you never see them in order. <laughs> you don't. You don't ever see them in order. I feel like um, if you were a child of the '80s, you watched USA Up All Night a lot. Yeah, yeah. Hosted by Gilbert they, Godfrey. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So they were like um, and then some blonde that. girl with like big boobs too. I forgot who that was. <laughs> Oh my god, what was it? There was, there was, who was the other guy? The trailer park one, too. The trailer um, there was Gilbert park. Gottfried, one. who did one. They, they all had all these shows, like, that where they would, like, premiere, like, B horror movies. Well, the, there was Captain USA, and he never did anything mainstream. Like, he was the first time I'd ever saw, like, I, I, the only way I ever knew what Howling was is because watching Howling 2 on Captain USA. And again, it was it, my parents left me alone on Saturday. This is the eighties. I'm seven years old. You know what I mean? I've mean, got access to cable, watching whatever I want, watching stuff I should not be watching that I was embarrassed to watch. I would flip back and forth. There was something, some anime movie I remember watching, and it it had like giant slugs that were eating people, or whatever, and their bones oh and skin God, were coming Reddit off. Too. I can't think of the name of it. And there was I like, totally and, and there, but they were good apparently. And there was this girl, and she was trying to like push them back, and like she was getting like burned by the ass in the water and I'm like what am I watching <laughs> again to this day I cannot there, there's so much anime out there it's impossible to try and go okay so it looks like this with giant bugs and so on and so forth and they're like right because that doesn't describe a thousand other anime cartoons I was like okay so there was this giant robot and he would shoot his fists and there was like a female companion and she would shoot her boobs and uh, what was that show called they're like Again, giant robots that shoot their fists and giant female robots that shot their chest out <laughs> narrows it down to nothing. <laughs> right, right. But you describe Freddy Krueger and you're like, oh, yeah, that was this film or whatever. So because now they're like they're so widely available and well known. And then it was like in 1999 they put out the Friday the, the Nightmare on Elm Street box set on DVD because DVD had become a big thing and on VHS. And I didn't have a DVD player at the time, so I bought the VHS one or whatever, and I watched them all in a row in order. And I think that was also the first time I'd seen like part like five, and then uh, I think yeah I think that was also the first time I'd probably had ever watched part two. And again, growing up in the eighties and nineties, you you know you're kind of like not as you're not as sensitive to what like the the you know terms like oh that's the gay movie don't watch that one. I always say that part two is one of the scariest of the the franchise. If you really watch that movie without um like thinking of it as like the gay one or something you know so yeah, they always say like um they have the gay one they have the christian one they have the mtv one they have the one that ruined the franchise um, they just have all sorts of names for them but that's like describing was really scary. that's like describing star trek 4 is like that's the one with the whales <laughs> <laughs> they saved the whales in that one what was the name of that one star trek 4 they saved the whales <laughs> they saved the whales <laughs> Where are they now? Like they saved the whales back then. Where are they now? Where are they when Sea World needs them? But when uh, we had Mark, um, we had Mark on the show. Uh, he came actually in studio. He agreed to come to the studio as long as I picked him up at the uh, hotel and brought him back to the hotel, which was really yeah. nice. And uh, you know, I asked him about the aesthetic, like you know, making the part two. Did you guys know that this like material was being written this way and how ridiculous it was? And I again described the same way as I described you. I was like, it was like He Man in the eighties, where it's like this would never pass today. This is so ridiculous. When you have a He Man cartoon where He Man's grabbed by one of his enemies who's basically wearing almost the same outfit he is and they're like he's like hugging him from behind and they're loincloth the loincloth like thrusting each other and you're like what is he doing to you, man? <laughs> yes yes have you ever seen that saturday Night live skit from the 90s the cartoon cartoon fun house the ubiquitously gay duo yes i feel like that was based off of he-man <laughs> 
like that's how I, I when I would watch that I'd be like this is pretty much just me. yeah because they would do something incredibly gay and they would turn around and be like what and then everyone's like nothing <laughs> everyone was like look away like nothing <laughs> You know, they'd pat each other on the butt several times or whatever. They're 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 like they would go sixty nine in order to combine their powers <laughs> and they would be thrusting into each other's mouths. Yes. Yes. <laughs> their car looked like a giant cock. <laughs> oh my god, I remember that. <laughs> There is nothing funny about this. And yes, Saturday Night Live still produces these cartoons once in a while. It's It's Saturday Night Live. They're on at 11 o'clock for a reason. (laughs) They just had a great skit, uh, not to get political on this show, but they had a skit where uh, Hillary Clinton transforms into Bernie Sanders. (laughs) I've heard about this, but I have not seen it. I haven't watched Saturday Night Live in years. Well, there was uh, one a few years ago where The Rock was a Barack Obama. It was another actor playing Barack Obama, but but I think the Avenger movie was coming out, and uh, The Rock had a movie coming out too. And uh, there was – I forget the actor playing Barack Obama, but then he turns into like The Rock Hulk. (laughs) So it's The Rock's now a Barack Obama Hulk. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> do you plan on like submitting this to film festivals and stuff um we would like to that's our our ultimate goal what we want to do is we would like to premiere it at a convention okay and we want to have like a premiere possibly like a like a q a or something like after the premiere like in the same room um and then we would like to submit it to some festivals we don't really know which ones we're going to submit it to um but that's our goal. And then we've like a couple of people have asked us um, where they can watch it afterwards. We have um, a YouTube channel set up for it. It's not live yet. So we're going to wait until. Um, oh yeah. Cause you got to do it for free. You can't like stick it on Vimo or something. Right. No. Yeah. And then we talked about um, some people asked like if we would put it on DVD and stuff. And so we're talking around. That's here. expensive. <laughs> it, it's very expensive. But um, our whole thing with this is that this is kind of like a love letter to the fans. So if even if we put it on DVD, like and we brought it to if, conventions, we if, would just give it to people. Like we wouldn't, you know. Yeah. If you don't put it on DVD, there'll be the bootlegger at the table three rows over who will be like, "Hey, that's my movie," along with everyone else's fan films. Thanks. Exactly. How much you make on those? Can I have okay. some of that money? <laughs> that's my movie. Okay. Like we can't make a profit off. Of I this. know. We'll but I would love to meet somebody who literally went up to one of those bootleg guys or whatever, whipped out their ID, and said, "Hey, look, that's mine." Can I have the money from that? Because I'm two seconds away from calling the police on you for copyright. Uh, I'm, I'm, so, Michelle, I'm waiting who, for that actor to come on the show to tell me the story that he actually did that. <laughs> that would be amazing. Um, Michelle, who is um, my producing partner, co-writer, and co-director, she knows like the law inside and out. And I would not put it past her if she's seen our film at a table where she would go right up, take the stack of DVDs, walk away, come back with a piece of paper and say, you have to sign this. Oh my God, that would be so funny because the person would be like, have- what are you doing? Stealing? And then, and then of course they call security and then you call the cops or whatever because the cops, if the cops have like tips on a, a cop, you know, it's a federal crime, but local police will get involved if they find out there's a, uh, a scam going on and bootlegging is a scam. So right. I would totally. love that. And I would hope someone's videotaping it. It puts it on YouTube. Oh, I'm totally being videotaping and I put it on the YouTube channel. I'd be like, please. I'm like, that would give me a thousand views. Oh, my God. That would be the best video to watch. And everyone would be like, that's what you get from piracy. Screw you. Yeah. <laughs> so I just completed my own short film. Um, it's called The Radio Station. It was filmed here at the radio station. And okay. it, it I, I'm here at night, at midnight, um, alone. And, like, again, Mark came, like, live in the studio, and he even said, he's like, dude, this this station's really creepy, and I've been in Nightmare on Elm Street. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, it is, trust me. <laughs> Try doing this for nine years, Mark. <laughs> and then I've also had Kane, I've also had Kane Hodder and his writer from his book, uh, the, the, you know, the Kane Hodder biography that he wrote in here or whatever, and Kane said the same thing. He's like, you come in here every single night? at midnight to do this show. <laughs> you know, Kane's is like big stocky guy, whatever. It's kind of creepy in this place. And I've been in Friday the 13th. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and I said to him, you know what? Mark said the same thing last year when he came on. <laughs> He's like, all right, let's do the interview. <laughs> in that very Kane Hodder kind of way. Uh, that's my best Kane Hodder impersonation, by the way. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, very 
it's basically a very simple plot. You know what I mean? And it's not like this is not like I'm gonna film like play Mister for me. You know what I mean? The story has no dialogue. It's basically a DJ coming on to a late night show, and then uh, a stalker through the perspective of the camera is walking around the station, kind of like you know going in other rooms that she's not in and such. And then she's attacked, and then that's it. But then there's like a kind of a twist at the end of it. It's like four minutes long, and a okay. friend of mine's like. That's perfect because you're not you don't have any dialogue written for your short and anything longer you're just li- literally just touring your own radio station which is like you know where is this kind of going in the plot of this little short film or whatever but then you see her getting attacked and then uh, you know I'll, and uh, and and then something else happens which I'm not going to spoil because now because now because now I just spent all. I spent like four hours last night on Film Fan, Filmland. Is that the film submission website? Kind of like a like it, it's kind of like a monster. You stick your resume up there and then you submitted out the things. But this is like you submit, you put your film on this website, a big description in the credits or whatever, and then you just start using that site to submit your film to film festivals. You pay their fee if there's a fee or not, and so on and so forth. I can have it set up through credit cards, PayPal. It's perfect. You're not sitting there going, oh, i got to break out the envelope, buy a flash drive, stick it in there, mail it to them, load it up on a Vimo. No, you load it up on this website, and there are, according to the count, 25,000 film festivals connected to this website, including things like Fright Fest and the National Academy of the Arts, which is connected to the Oscars, is connected okay. to this website. Yeah. And there's like any – what they said – that basically they said any – I talked to somebody who uses it all the time and said any film festival who doesn't use this site is really stupid because this site is a godsend to submit a film because <laughs> everything's digital nowadays, and this just makes it so much easier. <laughs> so, of course, I immediately went after every single potential film festival I could go after that's free – submitted to them or whatever. A few of them I had to back out of what immediately when I was like, oh, wait, this is the LBGTQ film festival. It has nothing to do with my film or whatever. And I said that to the, the actress in it, and she's like, well, you could have written me in a scene with another woman where instead of it's mean because I'm in the film as well and we, like, shake hands and I, we part ways to hand the show off to her or whatever. She's like, well, you could have written another woman in there and we could have, like, kissed in part ways or whatever, and then you could have submitted, but no. <laughs> I was like, you just wanted to make out with another woman. She's like, well... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you could always say, you know, we don't say it, but the main character, she's a lesbian. So yeah, you could that's, I, I, that. my, my, my actress has such a great sense of humor. She would totally go with that just to <laughs> get more recognition. <laughs> and she does. And funny enough, she's a bondage fetish model. So she does like photo shoots oh. with other women in states of, you know, artistic bondage and things like that. I could actually get away with that. Thank you so much, Paige. <laughs> I have to say it. <laughs> all about to come up so i've submitted it to 45 different film festivals a few of which i paid for they're like two dollar three dollars tons of free ones and then like one or two like 20 bucks ones which actually um for reasons of like i know where the money is directly going to like one's going to a scholarship one's going to something else so i know it's not just like going to the film festival pocket people who i've never met before and i could care less about so hopefully it'll go somewhere but i i know the stress of trying to put it together because i've i went back and forth with my editor for like weeks about this that and the other thing and then of course now i just found out that his own credits missing from the credits so I had to email him and said, by the way, I know we were all done and set and all, but uh, you're not in the credits for editing this movie. <laughs> right. So hopefully he sends me another copy soon. <laughs> And the film festival's website is very well done that you can just upload a new copy. If it, Let's say you needed a change, you need to upload a new copy. It doesn't affect any of your submissions at all. Your submissions stay the same if you have to upload a new copy of your film for whatever reason. Like, again, a missing credit or something you noticed in your own film that's like, oh, there's a scratch or there's a whatever that needs to be fixed real quick. You know what I mean? So, which is really great because some, you know, you, you, I was worried. I was like, oh, crap, am I going to lose all my submissions? Oh, my God, stress, stress, stress. Oh, wait. Okay. <laughs> That is, that's scary that like, you're like, crap, even if you notice the one thing, you don't want to lose everything you just did, especially if you're paying for it, you know? Now, can you talk about who the other characters in your film are? Are they characters from Nightmare on Elm Street? Yes. So I will talk about that. Um, Is Nancy's so, father alive? Because he was alive in part three. <laughs> Do we find okay. out how their relationship got broken up? <laughs> okay. So I, I will say this. So we are going to have Donald in our film and there's going to be a very interesting scene involving Donald and Nancy where you kind of see the dynamic of their relationship change. Okay. So you see you see the shift because when you end Nightmare 1 
you know, she, she calls her dad and she says, I need you to come and knock down the door. Promise me you'll be here. And Whoa. he's not. No, wait. Wait, the, the you mean the, the very end or like towards the ending? Because the very end, it was... St- towards the end. Okay, towards, yeah. So towards the end. Because as much as I love Nightmare on Elm Street, I still think the ending to that movie is as confusing as hell as you're just like, wait, so they're all alive again? It was all a dream? Then like, mom guys. dies? What? <laughs> yeah, we're we're going to explain that too. So okay. We're going to explore... We're gonna explore um, essentially what happens it's at the all gonna end. be explained it's all going to be explained in this illustrious movie um no but donald in nightmare one she says you know just come knock down this door um please 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 and he promises her well when he doesn't show up all that stuff happens at the end of the movie you know her mother gets burned by freddie and you know they stand there watching kind of in shock and then it like cuts to her coming out of her front house and her mom is alive and you know why right what you know why right well i know that they wanted it open-ended for sequels yeah and they also couldn't figure out how to end for it yeah and they couldn't figure out how to end the movie either (laughs) right they they filmed like three different endings to it and they were just like let's just use them all oh sure because that's filmmaking and even wes hated that idea i mean he says that in his biography (laughs) He wanted the ending of it to be that Nancy wakes up and it was all a dream. That's the, he did, he didn't want it to be open ended. He wanted it to be done. He didn't see the potential, which you know, good on Bob Shea because we wouldn't be talking about this movie and I wouldn't be making a fan film if there weren't sequels to it because you know we wouldn't have part three to be like what happened to Nancy. So, but our film we're definitely we're going to explore that. So there's a scene in our film with Nancy and Donald and it kind of throws it back to the end of nightmare one where she's, you know, um, I can say not too happy with him. Okay. Cool. And now is there, is there going to be a Freddy Krueger in your movie? Of course. I mean, come on, we can't have a nightmare on Elm Street without Freddy. No, Um, but I was, I was thinking like, you know, since he's kind of defeated and he's off, you know, uh, uh, hanging out with Mark in, in part two at this time, um, and then he's defeated. Uh, that you know, like sh- like the presence of Freddy would be there. Or like there'd be a shadow or you know something. I didn't know. I was like I was like I know because I was I was looking at this going you know Freddy's kind of defeated. And of course, where does he go when he's defeated? He goes back to hell, I guess. He goes on a he goes back to that area of Beetlejuice where ghosts go. <laughs> <laughs> he's like waiting with his ticket with a guy with a shrunken head. <laughs> he's sitting right next to Michael Keaton. <laughs> Yes. Oh my God. Yes. No, our film, um, I, I'll say this. I, I probably will get in trouble for it, but I don't care because I want us to say it. Um, where our film takes place right after Nightmare One happens, like immediately after Nightmare One. And then our, our thought process and our storytelling process is, is that it happens right before Nightmare on Elm Street 2. And then again later on in the film, it's right before Nightmare on Elm Street three. Okay. So you know, in that time period, you know, Freddy is, you know, he's he's exhausted all his his uh, dream demon powers. I guess his mojo. Say. His mojo. His, his mojo. His, his evil mojo. Back on him. So. So yeah. So we explore a lot of that. We actually. Um, uh, Freddy is in it, but it's mainly about Nancy, and it's about like her having to overcome all the stuff and you know our, our Nancy has gone through some stuff because it's very traumatic what happened to her in Nightmare 1 and you know losing everybody around her you know and then now she's like I can't believe this you know so so our Nancy is very like traumatized and her interaction with or without Freddie in our film because can't say if they're going to interact or not oh uh, <laughs> Freddie is uh he's even different because he he went through you know some stuff at the end of the film you know someone turned their back on him and took away all of his power so we're gonna kind of explore a little bit of that we don't um Freddie's not like the main character in our film he's kind of like the background yes character. it's a Nancy centric film 
Right, it's a Nancy centric film, but I will say that our Freddy is evil. He is not um, the Jay Leno stand up comedian that they made him out to be towards the end of the film series. Which was yeah, I mean three through six, he that's what he becomes. I mean one and two, he's uh, he's he's a little jokey, but he's still terrifying. Uh, three, he's borderline. Four, it's when he loses it. And of course, surprisingly, that's what everyone wants because isn't four the highest grossing of them all until Freddy vs. Jason? <laughs> but you know what I say? I, th- I, th- I think that um, part four is the highest grossing because of part three. So I think everyone went to see part three and how amazing Dream Warriors war- was. And then they went to see part four. And you know, part four was the highest grossing because... You know, everybody went to see it, but then what happened with part five? It was a huge drop off. Oh, so I awful. That had, had part four been greater than Dream Warriors, you know, part five would have been really great at the box office, you know. So, you know, our Freddy, he, um, he does have some comedic lines because you can't have Freddy in there without saying something. But it's it's more he's more evil, and then as it shifts towards the end of the films, you know he might he might have like one line or two lines that's like a little comedic. But he's definitely darker. He's definitely scary. He's very reminiscent of like Nightmare on Elm Street one and Nightmare on Elm Street two. Who's gonna be doing the makeup uh, for your Freddy, <laughs> and who's gonna play your Freddy? So um, our Freddy is being played by William Adams, and he um, is known as the Nightmare Man on YouTube. He is the Nightmare Man in the convention circuit. So, like, he cosplays as Freddy. We decided that for time-wise and budget-wise that we were going to use um, a a mask for Freddy. Uh But he has a ridiculously expensive one that looks just like the makeup that, like, the special effects artist did. And then we're doing um, tricks to the actual mask itself to make it appear more darker or more evil. Gotcha. But sorry, I'm like I have to drink some water. <laughs> like, no, that's fine. That's fine. Um, but yeah, so we're um he's gonna play him, and he actually has played him in, I think it was called a Midsummer's Nightmares or something. And the thing I thought him is is uh he he's not just like a, a cosplayer. He actually is like an actor. So he he does the funny Freddy at conventions because that's what people want. But if you've ever really seen him like turn it on he's really scary like he could really scare the costume so we were like when we were casting Freddy there was nobody else that we wanted you know he was he was our go to do you have some time for a couple quick uh, Nightmare on Elm Street questions before we uh, we let you go for sure, I have, I have all the time in the world. So if you, if you want to ask me some more questions about the film, I'm down for that too. So whatever you want to do. Okay, so hardcore Nightmare on Elm Street. I'm not going to ask you any th- ask questions about the television show because you've never seen I, it, apparently. Shame on you, God. I've seen the first episode of it. Oh, the one by, directed by Toby Hooper, yeah. Okay, all right. In Nightmare on Elm Street Part 4, what is the name of Kincaid's dog? Jason. Yes, all right. That's good. <laughs> In Freddy vs. Jason, who, I'm sorry, in uh, Jason Goes to Hell, who played Freddy Krueger? Was it Kane? Yes, it was. Yeah, that's what I thought. It was Kane Hodder. What, uh, what, famous, uh, what, what famous role uh, is uh, John Saxton? What, John Saxton? Yes, yes. What famous role was he known for prior to The Nightmare on Elm Street? Um, he was in Enter the Dragon with Bruce Lee. There you go. Wow, you are uh, you are three for three. <laughs> <laughs> I told you. you know, so. Who was the art? Who was the poster artist for the Nightmare on Elm Street movies? Oh my God! I told you just based on him, and I know who this is because we have something not with him, but something similar in the works. Oh my God! I can't remember his name. And I used to be Facebook friends with him. I can't remember his name. I'm horrible. I'm sorry. You want to get? I'll give you an extra minute. I can't. I don't know it. I'm so horrible, and I'm not going to cheat. I'm not going to look at my phone. The uh, the original the original poster artist uh, Matt, Matthew Joseph Peake. Okay. Yes. Yes. And yeah. <laughs> That's for the first one. I don't know the others. Uh, I think I, he's the others. I think that he he did do the other film. Okay. All right. Who was the composer for the Nightmare on Elm Street music? Uh, a score which is never used really in almost any of the other films, unfortunately, due to studio stupidity as the guy said it on my show when he came on in 2010. Is it Charles Bernstein? Yes. 
Yes. Yeah. He didn't actually say that professionally. He probably couldn't, but that was pretty much what he was trying to say. <laughs> I'll say it for him because I don't work for New Line Cinema or Warner Brothers or whoever the hell owns the copyright to Nightmare on Elm Street now. All right, those are five questions. I was going to bog it down with a whole bunch more. <laughs> um, is your fan film allowed to have anybody from any of the films in your film? Or is that, is that, is that a That's spoiler a that might actually happen? I mean, it'd be amazing if some of the original peoples from the films came on board. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think that it would be cool. Yeah. If that was... I, uh, I mean, I'm sure you could just call up Lawrence Fishburne right now and be like, hey, we got this movie we're making. <laughs> I mean, I'm going to do my Rolodex and be like, Patricia Arquette, Lawrence Fishburne, Johnny Depp, do you guys want to do a fan film right now? Um, no, if, if, um, I think that, that it would be amazing if... We did ever had a funeral for your, her boyfriend. Would you like to have an open casket funeral for uh, Johnny Depp? Would you like to lie in a casket for us? <laughs> right. I don't think there's much left. Do you want to do that frying pan scene in Nightmare 6? I don't think there's much left of Nancy's boyfriend um, after what happened to him. So. No. <laughs> I mean, you know what? I will tell you here. You have the, you have the exclusive. Are you ready? Ten, uh, what, how, many, how much blood do we have? Any? Eight pints? Sorry. Say that again. You, we lost you for a second. I'm sorry. I said, here you go. You have the exclusive. I'm going to tell you. We okay. do have someone from a Nightmare on Elm Street being in our films. It is Johnny Depp. <laughs> and... Unfortunately, he's going to be in um, a white bucket, but I mean, that's what's going to be left of him, and we're going to pour him all over the floor. So, I mean, there, that's the exclusive. Johnny Depp will be in our family. <laughs> I think for just for accurate reasons, because that didn't look, that looked like more than eight pints of blood to me. And that's oh how much God. blood is in the human body, okay? Let's get real yes, now that, there, Mr. That, West Craven. And not explained in our band film, so that will not be explained. Now, the question is all your budget going to go into like a rotating room? <laughs> you're going to build a rotating room, or you're going to call up like like Fox or something and say, hey, do you still have that rotating room in the fly that was used in the Nightmare on Elm Street? Is that, is that like in storage somewhere? <laughs> I am. Um, I love that. I wish we did, but I mean, our sets are pretty awesome as it is. We have, uh, we're filming in Columbus, Ohio, and we're filming on. Um, this amazing like sound stage, this like 500 square foot like set. Wow! And it's yeah, yeah. it's pretty awesome. Um, we we got really lucky when we found it, and it has pretty much everything that we need. We're filming on multiple locations, but this is like our main location for the the main meat of the film. How sweet, yeah. fresh meat! <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Oh, I, I was mentioning to Deandra. Uh, I don't know sure if you were aware of this page. Did you you know? Did you know that there was a Friday the Thirteenth video game coming out for the PlayStation Four and Xbox Three uh, Xbox One? I did. I am actually. I'm not a Friday the Thirteenth fan. I have. I just for some reason can't sit through those films. I don't know what it is, but they're not I as did. intelligent as the Nightmare on Elm Street movies, and that's saying a lot, they, unfortunately. Okay. <laughs> Respects to Kane Hodder, but like, it's just a guy in a mask like walking around exactly and again the nightmare on elm street movies are good for horror fans but let's face it they're not the ones west worked on are really like kind of stood out you know what i mean and i'm really going to pick on one in seven and saying being like you want to watch a great horror movie watch one in seven okay 100%. the rest are like uh, fan service if you're a horror fan you love the films you love the actors whatever watch them but they're not good movies and i'm gonna say that you know I, 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 i'm never gonna I, lie and say that they're oh my god part three patricia arquette that's why she's on ghost whispers no that, it's just terrible movies i mean the kills are great but one in seven. I, I love part three. I think that three, three is the fan favorite. That's the one that everybody loves. I'm sure we're gonna get a lot of hate mail about saying that, but yeah, hey, you know, so it's just. A lot of hate mail. I love three. Three is my favorite. But so. one in seven, West directed. You know what I mean? Se well, seven is amazing. I mean, seven just. Seven is beautiful. Seven That's seven's what you beautiful. have when you have a budget access to a budget, which he didn't have on one. So you won't look at one in seven, and yeah, you know, go well. One is like this really nice kind of you know '80s style film, and it does look pretty at times. But you look at seven, and you're like, wow. If right. Wes had that budget on part one, this is what part one would look like. Exactly. And again, I love the I love Freddy Krueger, and I do like the films, but I'm never gonna say I'm never gonna recommend, uh, and you know those films over one and seven. Like Freddy's Dead. I, I, I'm, I <laughs> no, yeah, okay. Let, let's yeah, let's let come on. Freddy's Dead was just 
I mean, that th- like, Freddy's dead is it? as bad as Jason goes to hell, with the exception of the fact that Freddy Krueger is actually in the movie and Jason goes to hell. Jason is blown up in the beginning and then shows back up at the end after being like reborn, going into his sister's, you know what? Oh my god. <laughs> Yeah, I've never seen those movies. So oh, you never know. saw that? Yeah. Jason is blown up by the FBI at the very beginning. <gasps> Shocker spoiler. By the FBI, by an FBI agent who's posing as like a a, a bootylicious camp counselor undressing and getting in the shower because that's going to trigger Jason to come out of nowhere. Oh, there's a teenage girl getting naked. Gotta go kill her. I mean, as soon as she steps in the shower, that's when Jason appears. <laughs> that's, what all, that's what all the other slasher movies are about, and that's why I love A Nightmare on Elm Street. Yeah, he's like, spider sense is tingling. That There's a flirtation. naked woman in my showers. <laughs> but you're right. I mean, Freddy, it's not quite a it, – it's the same formula, and people got tired of it, and people were insulted by it, even though, yeah, there was always like, who was the survivor of every single one of those movies? A woman. Right. <laughs> But there were a lot of women killed off, unfortunately. So, yes, the slasher genre is, like, you know, a little sexist. But, uh, hey, you know, you, you you survived in the end. Except for the Tommy Jarvis trilogy. That was Tommy. <laughs> and then, of course, they had that, like, great Nightmare on Elm Street uh, crossover with um, Ash for the Evil Dead and Jason. And, like, all the Nightmare... Freddy, uh, the Nightmare and Friday survivors teamed up with Ash to take down Freddy and Jason again. Yes. And it was terrible halfway through it. I, I did not read it. No, um, don't ever read it. It's like parts of it are okay. Freddy's daughter helps bring her father back and the two make out and he like kind of fingers something just it's like oh my god what are you doing they kill off the survivors very quickly by the way like alice's kids grown up or whatever and his mom is like wiped out immediately ash is like hitting on all of them then they defeat jason and freddy and then there's dream then there's like part two where jason's like one of his hands is cut off so he's got this machete in his hand freddy uses the necronomicon to take over the world like puts Jason back in a more less chewed up looking body because he's been shot to death so many times his body is literally falling apart um, and then Ash uses the Necronomicon to uh, stop Freddy and Jason but goes back in time and it's kind of like it's like one panel he delivers evidence to the police to indict Freddy Krueger okay. negating the entire timeline because so he's, inc- just, he's incarcerated. He can't be freed because there's no evidence against him. So it means he won't be burned to death and won't become the dream, you know, demon that he is. Right. And I'm like, that's actually kind of smart. You know, that had been made into a movie where Ash, because then, because that's what, that, at that point, because don't forget, they were supposed to make a Freddy versus Jason versus Ash movie. They were. And one of the original scripts for that movie was Ash was going to time travel with the Necronomicon and stop the creation of Freddy and Jason. And that would have been perfect because then we would have had the remix. You know what I mean? The the the, the universe would have officially ended on a great note. I mean, yeah, the, just, they would he would have he would have stopped all this death from happening on both ends. You know, on Elm Street and in Crystal Lake. Um, oh, and then he goes to like Crystal Lake and he becomes a camp counselor in the eighties. <laughs> so which means he's probably going to stop the death of Jason Voorhees or the fifties or whatever. You know, he's going to stop the death of Jason Voorhees as a child, which means he won't come back and become a serial killer. So he indicts Freddy, stops Jason's original death negates the entire timeline and i'm like that would have been brilliant you know (laughs) i mean the films would have still existed i mean they're not going to erase from existence in the real in the real world but in terms of like a freddy versus jason versus ash movie that would have been awesome but it never came to happen we got two mediocre half-ass comic books which again were awful the whole thing with freddy's daughter having killed him in part six then all of a sudden for no explanation resurrecting her father and being in an incestuous relationship with freddy is like oh my god who wrote this (laughs) This is a Wildstorm comic book, by the way. Wildstorm was owned by DC Comics, and yes. they folded it underneath <laughs> them. They were the last people to put out Freddy Jason uh, comic books, and we haven't had any Freddy and Jason comics since Wildstorm. Um, probably because Warner Brothers owns Wildstorm, DC Comics, and Freddy and Jason under the New Line Cinema branch. Right. So, yeah, Warner owns the rights to all of um, A Nightmare on Elm Street. Well, I think they share it now with Paramount. Something to do with like uh, Interstellar that came out a couple years ago. In order to get distribution rights for Interstellar overseas, because that was a joint picture with them, they had to sell them back the rights to Friday the 13th. Oh, okay. So I think Friday the 13th is now, once again, entirely all 12 films in the franchise owned by Paramount. But I might be wrong. 
I sort of sworn that's what I read on Dread Central years ago when Interstellar was coming out. Because again, Interstellar was one of those joint venture projects. Like, you know, uh, a, a, the next Spider-Man movie is going to be a joint venture between Disney and Sony. Right. So. Right. It's also confusing. It's like, it's it's just and We haven't had a Nightmare on Elm Street movie in six years, other than fan films, <laughs> because they cannot make one correctly. And they were pumping these things that's out like crazy in the 80s. I think the fan films are um, like exploding because they're fan films made by fans. And I think that they're made by the right people who should probably be making a real movie and Hollywood should do what they happened with Mortal Kombat and go, Hey, that Mortal Kombat thing was pretty good. Let's give this guy some money. And sure enough, he makes like two successful seasons of a show on machinima. Hey, this Friday the 13th or Nightmare on Elm Street movie is pretty damn good. Why don't we hire this guy to make our movie? He could probably make it in a year that it's taken them six years to make a Nightmare on Elm Street sequel and seven years to get anything going with Friday the 13th, which is like last time I heard we're going to get a TV series and that got canceled or it's, it's been no development whatsoever. And He was going to fight in the snow as a found footage movie. And now we're going to get the video game. And then this goes back to the thing about the video game I was mentioning to you. I said to Deandra, um, hey, if this video game is successful, how much do you want to bet we will get a Nightmare on Elm Street video game right afterwards within a year or two also probably kickstarted because they'll look at the friday the 13th movie as how the uh, friday the 13th the video game as successful as it is and to be like all right let's give the rights away to make a nightmare on elm street video game where you get to play freddy krueger or, or you get to play a dream warrior or a dream and- warrior i can't remember in the night the friday game and i kickstarted it by the way if i play as jason or if i'm playing as one of the counselors so i kind of w- don't want to play as jason because you know what are you doing you're going around killing people left and right i mean yeah you do that in games a lot but so that's all i'm gonna do is just kill people the entire I game like like n- like like um condemned which is a, a video game where you are on a reality show killing people for pleasure and fun <laughs> But you're uh, actually a sane person who has to do this in order to free yourself from the confines of the game or the, the plot of the game. Jason's just going to go around and kill people. I can't remember which. I should probably look it up. But, uh, again, we should get a nightmare game at some point. And nightmare. Robert should voice Freddy. <laughs> Robert should voice Freddy. Heather should voice a Nancy character. We I, should get Tuesday to do Kristen. I think, we should... we, I think we should get some new teens, but all of the uh, – you know some of the fan favorite actors. You know, like you like you like like you said, Kristen, or you know they can get Patricia Arquette. You know they get Ken, they can get Mark, or whatever, and come back and play either character versions of themselves or something. You know what I mean? If you're trying to make it in continuity, it doesn't make a lot of sense because a lot of those characters got killed off. But I'm sure you could do something that'd be like, or just have them in motion capture suits so that'd be like, oh, it's th- you know. It's him, definitely, but he's like a completely different character. You know, they're the adult characters because they're all now older in their 40s and 50s. Um, and then you, you you hire a bunch of new actors to play the teens ready to whack off one by one. Right. I think it'd be awesome. Yeah. I'm, I think it's needed. It's, we need something different other than these NECA figures that they got. We need, like, a video game or we need, you know. The, the Child's Play game got canceled, unfortunately. But that wasn't so- kickstarted. Thank you, you know, and and but the the night the Friday film was kickstarted and was successful, massively successful. I ordered a physical copy of it. I needed a physical copy. <laughs> I want the satisfaction of getting that envelope in the mail and be like, oh, I have my Friday the Thirteenth game. Gotta go play it and never leave my room. <laughs> yeah. Well, Paige, thank you so much for coming on the show. Why don't you give away your Twitter and Facebook account? Is I gotta find it because it's brand new. I'll give you our Facebook account. Okay. Our Facebook account is Don't Fall Asleep Fan Film, and then our Twitter account is Don't Fall Underscore Asleep. Awesome. At Twitter. Cool. And you also have a makeup tutorial thing on YouTube. I do. Um, and that is called The Page Delicious, and that is on YouTube. And that was my personal YouTube. That now I'm kind of putting some of this stuff on there until we launch the actual film. Awesome. Again, thank you so much for coming on the show to talk about your film. And we look forward to having some of your co-conspirators from your film on the show with us once the film has been completed. Yes, I'm so excited. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure.